Welcome to Robotics and Automation News Webinars, where you can be part of a global event without leaving your home or office. Attend our live webinars and communicate directly with influential professionals in your industry. Hello, my name is Abdul Montakim. I'm editor of roboticsandautomationnews.com. In this interview, I speak to Bernhard Gross, Chief Technology Officer at Software AG, which is one of the leading software developers for the industrial sector, certainly in its native Germany. My, my name is Bernhard Gross. I'm the uh, CTO of Software AG. I started to join Software AG through an acquisition two years ago when uh, Software AG acquired a, a startup company which I co-founded and was the CEO of. The company name was uh, Cumulosity. And based, based on that acquisition two years ago, when I joined the company, I became responsible for um, a line of business or business unit, IoT and cloud globally for Software AG, which I managed until end of last year. And uh, this be beginning of this year, so I kind of helped to scale the whole business up and, uh, and uh, utilize uh, Software AG's uh, global uh, footprint we are you know 5000 people company 1 billion us dollar turnover and active in 70 countries and based on that footprint i scaled up that um, uh, acquisition technology and uh, introduced it to many new clients and uh, and that has become now a sizable business and it's part of the mainstream uh, uh, capabilities nowadays and uh, go to market mainstream organizations so we basically move forward and and I have uh, now been assigned as the CTO of the total portfolio which is much wider than just uh, um, you know IOT and analytics okay thank you um there's a couple of terms that, you know, I'd, I'd like you to give your um, views or perspective or insight on. Um, you know, buzz phrases, if you like, and things that people are very interested in. And it'd be good to get a, a, an expert's view on it. First is uh, digitalization. Uh, what does it mean? And can you give examples of where companies are? Uh, uh, where and how they're digitalizing. And, and I'll ask you later on about uh, how artificial intelligence is being integrated and examples thereof. But let's talk about digitalization first. I've heard a lot about it. Uh, why is it such a big deal and, and what's happening in, in that space in terms of the industrial companies? Because I know you're, you're uh, probably very heavily involved with a lot of industrial companies. Being a German company, uh, with such a uh, massive engineering sector over there. Uh, what, what does digitalization mean for them? Yeah, exactly. So I guess um, it's a quite open uh, question, I have to admit, but it's a very good one as well. Because uh, first of all, digitalization and digital transformation, the term has evolved over the last 15 years or so. I don't know how long that term is uh, available in the market, but in the past, companies focused on digitalization initiatives towards their IT, uh, you know, back-end systems, you know, like you did introduce ERP systems, CRM systems, you know, your HR function became completely digitalized, you had a, a process automations implemented and so on. But that was all mainly focused towards the IT back-end environment. Today, the very same term, digitalization, has a complete other meaning. Today, digitalization means the convergence of the physical world with the uh, IT world in your enterprise environment. So that complete convergence, something we call a connected world. So a truly connected world means that basically literally everything you can imagine is connected and communicates and generates data and out of that uh, environment you know companies are very interested to optimize uh, you know their business processes to generate new business opportunities and obviously to 
increase customer intimacy, i.e. Uh, customer experience. So these are really three, three focus areas. And, and so to sum up, uh, to kind of sum up that long answer to your question, digitalization in our terminology, in our definition is the new way of digitalization. It's that internet of things is that truly connected world and that's happening in our private world, but also in the business world, and especially also in the industrial Internet of Things environment. Yeah, it's, it's the industrial sector from which we get a lot of our readers. The vast majority of our readers are from industrial backgrounds, manufacturing, logistics. And as I say, as far as I know, Software AG has a lot of involvement in that sector, which is why it's, uh, you know, it's really interesting to get your perspective on it. Um, and I know it's a general question, but it's good to start with the uh, more general things and, and then maybe get into more specifics. Again, just another general one, as, as I say, artificial intelligence, a lot of people talk about it, machine learning, deep learning, and all this kind of stuff. What does it mean in terms of um, uh, industrial processes? What can it do? What are the benefits? And maybe one or two examples of uh, how people are applying it at the moment. Yes, so, so you're absolutely right. So one of our key focus areas uh, as a, a software house, we are actually a software product company. It's best to describe us. But one of our um, main focus areas is in, in indeed industrial um, Internet of Things. However, we are also, you know, working with uh, financial services, uh, with, with many different uh, companies. The Fortune, out of the Fortune 1000, half of them are our customers. So that's how kind of, uh, you know, um, so we have been, we have integration technologies, web methods, uh, IO, hybrid integration, um, uh, you know, uh, technology which has helped companies to optimize the data flow from on-prem systems to cloud systems to uh, other vendors or supplier systems, so B2B integration, cloud-to-cloud uh, -cloud integration, cloud-to-on-premise. These are very important technology for that very fragmented uh, uh, world we are facing, very um, you know, separated data sources. And in, to make sense out of this new, truly connected world, you have to have these integration capabilities. We support over 300 connectors, meaning uh, integration points out of the box without software coding. So it's a very massive initiative. In addition to that integration initiative and API management, we have our IoT and analytics part. And for um, and in the IoT analytics part, uh, machine learning or artificial intelligence are an important role, plays an important role. And um, and you know, uh, to give you a, a typical project example in that area, that's I think that's what you what you asked for, right? In that mm -hmm. that sense, yes. Yeah. So. Typically, what companies are starting with, and I give you a, a, one of our clients is a wind turbine manufacturer company with the name Nordex. You know? Nordex has um, deployed almost 7,000 wind turbines globally, and they produce obviously energy. And now what they have to do is, um, what they're using our technology for, cloud technology as well as uh, as well as on-prem edge, edge computing technology. They started a project where they, you know, first selected data and, and monitored the conditions of their installed base globally. So very, uh, I mean, I say very straightforward. Actually, that's not so straightforward if you do it on a global scale with all that connectivity issues and so on. But from a conceptual point of view, quite straightforward project, connecting all these wind turbines and, and, and uh, do condition monitoring, analyzing the energy production, uh, alarm management, fault management, configuration management, all remotely done in, a, in an operating center. So that was the first phase of a project. It's typical phases in, in IoT projects. 
So the second phase then was when they started to fully understand the new technology, they started to integrate its kind of process driven phase. They started to integrate that data into their existing processes and reshaped, redefined their processes like field services, like maintenance process, like support process, like spare part management process. All of these processes now, not anymore having that a, st a static process, but a dynamic process based on real time data collected from these different wind turbines or uh, installed bases. You know? So that was then, this is typically second step what you do as a company. And then the third one leads to your question. The third one is, what can you do more just rather than acting on real-time information is to predict future events, future um, happenings. And that's what, what we call then the machine learning or artificial intelligence phase, where you then actually really look into your data, you understand uh, situations and you run uh, AI algorithm who help, this algorithm help you to predict and optimize your, your business going forward. A simple, very commonly used uh, 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 use case in that sense is predictive maintenance. Yeah, and, and just to add to that, as far as I know, predictive maintenance, uh, it simply put, uh, means to monitor a machine, possibly with sensors, well, obviously with sensors, uh, monitor its vibrations and if it uh, vibrates too much or outside of parameters it means that there's something wrong and maybe it needs to be uh, fixed or, or some sort of um, preemptive action needs to be taken that that's what I understand of uh, predictive maintenance with machines but your the potential for AI to predict so many other things is is uh, you know is, is open to speculation but let's talk about the uh, the predictive maintenance part first because as I say a lot of our readers are in manufacturing and logistics sure. and they run machines and things like that could you give us a bit more of an insight or examples of um, what, what, how is predictive maintenance uh, conducted yeah so <coughs> um, the simple predictive maintenance use cases are um, exactly like you describe it, you know, you kind of, uh, you know, add uh, sensor technology around your machine, you think you want to monitor uh, rotation, uh, temperature, um, uh, whatsoever, like that. Um, the more complex ones are uh, use cases where you, in the factory floor, you know, infuse um, predictions so that's for example what we do with the robot uh, robot unit uh, robot unit from Dür. and um, i don't know if you know that company Dür is one of the largest uh, paint shop um, uh, 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 providers including the the robots who are painting the the automotive the cars and it's what we okay what what we are um, uh, that's one of our industrial clients and what we do with them is basically in the paint shop, you know, we, we install our software and help actually to predict the quality of the paint shop for every single car. Yeah. And how do we do that? Because we are collecting over 100,000 data points every second over 100,000 data points every second. And out of these data points, we have learned the algorithm, so the, 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 the uh, you know, AI algorithms, we have trained them to interpret this massive amount of data set with the quality outcome of, uh, of, the, uh, um, you know, of the painting of the cars. And what, what happens, um, you know, you can uh, uh, almost like, you know, uh, envision it in a way that if the pressure value of one uh, in one area it, it, it gets below a certain threshold and you know you have other uh, other um, uh, you know uh, 
how do you call it in English that uh, where, where the, the, the paint is uh, brushed, brushed on the car. And so you're kind of, you're collecting a full picture of the whole environment to understand the quality of the, 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 the paint uh, uh, job and then and, and anticipate, um, anticipate issues. You know, before we introduce that concept, and then basically you also have the cloud connected. So when, once you enhance that, you can also distribute it to all your other installed bases globally. And, um, and what's the difference? How did they do it before? Um, is actually that they had visual seriously. And that's most of the automotive um, uh, car producers still have that visual inspection about your painted cars. So actually there are people running around and visually inspecting them. And that's what we um, um, replaced with the with a fully um, uh, autonomous um, a quality and enhancement or quality program which utilizes um, artificial intelligence uh, algorithms. Yes. And that's more complex than just adding, you know, rotation or temperature sensors in a simple case, you know. This is really very deep into the robots, into the data flow, into the program, uh, into production shop floor environment. That's a very interesting example you gave. It reminds me of a time I used to work in uh, magazine design okay. uh, before and... Um, well, I, I was always uh, very enthusiastic about software, desktop publishing, you know, design software and how it can be very accurate. Uh, you know, you can place things very accurately. You can uh, decide what the color values are going to be, RGB or CMYK, various levels of each one. Mm -hmm. And all these things, I used to be more interested in the mathematical part of it. But my okay. colleague would always, well, he said once that uh, it's always the human eye that is the ultimate judge of what is, uh, what looks right or good or whatever, uh, yeah. ultimately. And what you're saying no, now not is... Not anymore. <laughs> <laughs> unfortunately, unfortunately, I don't know. It's up to, up to interpretation. But the reality is that through camera uh, inspection and visualization and the feedback then back to the production environment, we have that feedback loop where we can, you know, continuously improve the outcome uh, and the, the, the configuration and ensure that, you know, sometimes, you know, with the, with the, with the eye, uh, you know, with the, with the uh, manual uh, verification of the quality paint uh, a shop a job, um, sometimes they only did it after 10 cars, yeah? because there are humans involved. You have already painted 10 uh, cars with a, a less good quality because you know when the robots have an issue they have usually it's repeatable yeah so what we now do is we have a direct immediate verification on the quality and uh, and we stop the process if as soon as we uh, uh, recover or identify an issue and then uh, you know we don't paint 10 cars which we have to redo and manually uh, improve the situation and so on you know so it's completely changing it changes everything in a sense you know? it's just one example but that's that's the new the new world we are facing well it's a very good example it also uh, gives me an opportunity to ask you more about it i mean how much um uh, how, how common is that process? Because uh, is it uh, fairly common now that everybody uses a uh, robotic inspection, if I can call it that, rather than human inspection? Do all the car makers do that? Well, well, first of all, I have actually a video which shows you the process and what we are doing in a nice descriptive way. It's actually from our partner, Dior. It's not from us. Yeah? The, the software technology behind that is from us, but I'm happy to forward you. It's a three minutes video. It's very, uh, I like it a lot. It's a bit, they made it a bit as a science fiction type of mood, uh, video, for, but anyhow, um, you, will, you will get the, um, you will much better understand with that video um, the, 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 the project than what I just tried to describe. Yeah, yeah so... And, it's just at the beginning, to answer your question in a very straightforward way, we are at the beginning. That's reality. You know, a lot of people talk about 
uh, artificial intelligence, machine learning, and so on. But the last years where proof of concepts, pilots, we are only now seeing the first real commercial implementations happening. That's the reality, you know, especially in the industrial world. In the consumer world, let's say, um, or in the medical environment, you know, we have a lot of examples where you have, uh, you know, um, uh, 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 commercial projects already ongoing, but I would would say in the industrial side, we are just starting really to see the first commercial project. My guess would be this project with with Dure is probably one of the first of this kind. Interesting, very interesting. I think that's a competitive area because I think ABB have got a, a similar sort of. Um, IoT based paint uh, robot offering. I don't know what to call it, but uh, they're talking about similar things to what you're probably talking about. But I don't, I don't want to talk too much about it because I don't know that much about it. It's just a painting robot, as far as I know, cloud connected and, and all that. But um, it, it's interesting. Obviously, you're a software company, so I shouldn't really ask you about other people's types of companies, robotics companies, and all that. This kind of um, the, 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 one of the things about cover, uh, covering software companies and I, IT companies in general is that they can, their technology, whether it's software or, or um, even computers and everything, it's all purpose. It can be applied to any industry and any sort of um, function or task or application. Um, but what, give me an overview of what software AG uh, is you know doing in terms of what, what percentage of its business is industrial, what percentage of its business is in other areas, and also if there are commonalities, common things between the jobs that you do now. I mean, for example, do a lot of clients ask for AI? Do they ask for what kind of things do they ask for you to, you to do? Yeah. So. Um, <clears throat> In terms of industry verticals, so we have, um, you know, various uh, strong verticals, you know, like uh, um, uh, industrial is a strong vertical. I mentioned financial services, retail, um, you know, telecommunication. Um, it's, it's really, um, you know, uh, exactly like you described it, honestly. It's, uh, you know, as a, as a product software company, you're, you're, uh, per se, usually a bit like a horizontal provider to many industries, um, and as a solution provider for a specific use case or solving a specific problem, you tend to be uh, focused in one industry or a subcategory of an industry. So that's really the difference between solution providers and product uh, software companies. And so we we see a lot, yeah, uh, 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 and sometimes. Um, Partners of us are really bringing the, the software, enhancing the software and creating a solution out of it and bringing it to the market. So, so that's kind of the difference between us and a solution provider. Yeah. Right. Um, and, and how do you think it's going to progress in, in the next year or two in terms of what kind of things do you think the market is going to want? I mean, I, as I say, I find it... Uh, Difficult to cover because, on the one hand, as you're saying, it's a uh, it's a general purpose um, horizontal provider of, of various uh, technologies. Yeah. But I would imagine that when you get involved with a client, you do have to get very deeply involved because uh, some of these technologies haven't been done before. Uh, the one you were describing about the painting robot, these, these have to be programmed yes. and tested and exactly. developed for the first time ever. Some, some yeah, exactly, you're right. Yeah. yeah. What, so what we do is, uh, because uh, exactly to overcome this issue, um, so there's a lot of benefits why you have a product approach versus a solution approach. The benefit is you have one source code, one line of code you develop, right? And then you can replicate that across different industries on the global base. And that's, of course, a nice thing to do in terms of scalability. The drawback is people do not really want to have platforms because at the end of the day, what we offer often are platforms. We have software platforms, an, an IoT software platform called Comolosity. 
that's based on the platform I founded as a co-founder many years back. Yeah? So that's our IoT platform. We have enriched that with a lot of capabilities, but still it's a platform, it's not a solution. But people want to have solutions. So how, how to overcome that? We basically have what we call co-innovation concepts and programs where we have our own solution guys. We have a professional services arm of about 1,000 consultants globally, right? And these consultants, they help us to generate use cases, um, uh, solutions for specific projects like we did with Dure. It was a co-innovation project where Dure engineers and our software architects and software engineers joined up. They formed a team and generated that outcome. Without this joint effort, it wouldn't have happened. That's reality. And that's the new way you have to think. We think in platforms because of the economies of scale, and then we enhance the platform capabilities in agile co-innovation projects with our clients and, and partners. Right. And uh, what are the, if you can quantify, if possible, I don't know, you probably have some figures somewhere, but is it, are the benefits quantifiable in terms of percentage uh, of uh, how much money saved or, or how much time saved, efficiencies gained, productivity gained, or, or any kind of thing that you can say that this is what software does. Not software as a company, but software in general, IT, computer technology, IoT, AI, whatever you want to call it. This uh, trend of digitalization and becoming more tech-oriented in industrial companies in particular, uh, there must be some uh, easily discernible benefits. I don't know if you can tell me of any quantifiable benefits that you know of. Well, well, well there's a, a very, I mean, depends really per, per use case and, and, and so on. But, you know, I, um, out of experience, I usually say um, uh, it needs to be at least 20 persons somehow an improvement in uh, an efficiency gain or something it needs to be substantial yeah and uh, 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 so it needs to have a substantial benefit and often it is even more you know for example in logistics use cases we do um, uh, let's say from static routing you know let's say you you're you're uh, responsible to uh, 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 filling or actually um, uh, managing uh, containers, recycled containers for paper, plastic, and glass, and so on. You know, so what you have, you have a static uh, route. You drive every week, once or twice, to a certain location, and then you take the containers off and 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 clean them and put them back. And in today's world, in the truly connected world, you have connected these containers. You know exactly the fill levels. And you implement a dynamic routing so that every morning the driver has a different route based on, based on real demand rather than static routing. And that is simple examples, but this improves the efficiency of almost uh, 30, 40 percent for the transportation company. Yeah. So in this type of, but it's always use case specific. Thanks, Bernard. Send us an email at sales at robotics and automationnews.com to register for one of our many upcoming webinars. And if you'd like us to host your webinar, we have a range of options, including long-term lead generation packages and marketing campaigns. We look forward to hearing from you soon.